I came to the story of fracking very late, actually. By the time I realized that uh, fracking was a big deal, they'd already leased all the land within 20 miles around me. This is New York State. Right now we have a ban in New York State against fracking. But who knows how long that's going to last. So I came to the story realizing that it had surrounded me and all of New York State, uh, where the Marcellus Shale is. So I decided, after seeing some pictures and, looking and hearing these stories, I go to Pennsylvania to take a look at what's going on. It's about five years ago. So I went to Pennsylvania, and as soon as you get to the border of Pennsylvania, you could see the flares in the mountains. So I crossed the border. I, I went directly to one of those flares at dusk and started shooting pictures. It was the first pictures I ever shot, and I, I was floored. I couldn't believe this was actually going on. The northeastern United States is rich in natural gas. The gas is trapped in a geological formation that is known as the Marcellus Shale, which runs across several states and over the border between Pennsylvania and New York. Natural gas has been recovered from close to 10,000 wells in Pennsylvania alone. The controversial process of pumping a high-pressure mix of water, chemicals and sand into the underground rock to release the gas is known as hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. But with a drop in the global price of oil, shale gas production has slowed, leaving some to wonder about the real cost of fracking. But natural gas has been a complete blessing to our county. We have seen more prosperity than we ever have. We've had it added uh, $2 million, uh, $200 million, excuse me, of market value onto our county in just a couple of years. We've seen farms preserved for generations. And there's never been a, uh, a government program that's ever preserved family farms more than uh, natural gas. All the risks associated with oil and gas in general, which are not inconsequential, get magnified because of the scale of this activity. My first concerns was it's industrialization that's it's coming in here. This is a rural area. This is a farming community and low population. And then when I learn more about it, then I'm concerned about the pollution. With industrialization, there's usually pollution, contamination. It's opening day of the fishing season in Salt Springs State Park. Locals say that naturally occurring methane bubbles up through the water and that this venting gas was first set alight in 1795. Proof shale gas supporters say that fracking is not the cause of any reported water contamination. Well, there's never been one fresh water supply in the history of EPA or DEP in the United States ever been uh, contaminated from hydrofracturing. It's the very smallest part of drilling shale energy that there is. We have a few lakes that we call our water quality network lakes. We've monitored them for five years in a row, and we're going to look and see if there's anything we can see in the water quality data that would indicate anything changing over five years. And I don't think there is anything that stands out yet. While Pennsylvania's Department of Environmental Protection has no data to suggest that freshwater lakes have been contaminated in the region, there is growing evidence that this may not be the case for too much longer. The DEP's own website lists 250 reports of private water supplies, such as groundwater wells that have been impacted by oil and gas activities, activities that include fracking. The Mannings live with their grandchildren a few miles downriver from Salt Spring State Park and believe that shale gas production has polluted their water well. This is a map of our area. This is where we are. This is the Depew Well, which is the closest well in that direction. It's over 7,000 feet from our home. This is the Holland Beck, this direction, up this road, 4,000 feet. And this, this is the Webster, which is beyond the Holland Beck. Each of them, the well casing failure is in red. Each of those had a well casing failure. Campaigners argue that these gas well casing failures are one of the main causes of water supply contamination. The methane levels, 38,900 UGs per liter, which is 38.9 milligrams per liter. 
um, ethane, 71.6. We have high levels of metals. We have high levels of gases. It's all documented and the DEP still can't prove that it's the gas company at this time. Um, we have a map that shows that they're fracking on all sides of us and they have well casing failures on all sides of us and still they won't say that it's the gas company that caused it and we have no doubt that this is happening all over the place. We've met many people from around the country who have been in the same situation. One such family is the Splains. Fearful of the impact of the gas well just a few hundred feet from their home, the Splains now survive on bottled water. Since we've had the problem with the well in the back, we've done some research and we found out that all of the problems associated with fracking, most of those chemicals are um, undetectable by the human. You can't smell them, you can't see them, you can't taste them. But when everybody in the family is sick at the same time for no reason, frequently, it, um, it, it tells me that there's a problem, but how do you measure that? This well may be an exception to the rule, however, it's, it's a potential and you're never informed about what can happen. Um, they drilled the first well and they fracked it here, it was fine. The second well they drilled and something happened. And as a result, they were unable to contain the amount of pressure in that well and they were venting it off into the, into the air um, uh, up to four times a day. This is a video of the venting that they did on the well. At first it sounded like a jet engine, but they uh, put a baffle on because there were a lot of complaints and now it's a lot quieter. But this is a video of what it sounded like and God knows what's coming out of it. And they vented this like four times a day and for about a year and a half until they fixed it. We definitely know there's gas coming out um, and there's gotta be chemicals, what makes that steam? I know at least 1% of that steam is probably bad for me. That's good enough. Yeah, this is the well over here that I did the video from. Um, they flare it mostly at night for the longest amount of times. But as you can see, it's very close to the house. And I know of people around here that get sick from this. Of course, they won't say much. And here's a truck now. That's a cattle truck, though. Kind of different. The trucks that come through here, there's uh, at least three every every minute, minute and a half, and they run in, in threes, and they're very loud. You know, we're, we're pretty close to the road. Um, we're used to this being a very quiet highway, but not anymore. Uh, if I had my choice, it wouldn't be here at all but you don't get a choice. Uh, we're trying to move away. Um, we're not getting a dime from this, and the reason why I'm even talking to you is to try to keep others from being in this situation. Don't get these in your backyard. So. Like the Splains, the Mannings now cannot drink their well water and have to rely on trucking in water from elsewhere. This is our, our water supply and we have a 1100 gallon tank inside here that the gas company was filling for us for oh, roughly a year and a half, 19 months they filled it for us and when, when the DEP determined that they couldn't prove it was the gas company, uh, even though that there's a lot of documentation and proof of it, they still said that it wasn't but the gas company quit bringing us water and we have to deliver it ourselves now and we have to pay for it ourselves. It, about once a week we have to go and get a water truck it holds 600 gallons at a time and we have a, a hydrant up in Montrose it's municipal water we fill the truck come back we pump it into our tank and but 1100 gallons with a family of you know five or six doesn't go very far it divides the communities up there's a lot of people you know in this community because we've spoken out about our problems with our gas and our water supply that people that never met me a day in my life they they hate me because of it and they don't even know me a lot of people keep quiet they're afraid to speak i feel like it's um, the civil rights and our even our rights to speak out have been so uh, curtailed and restricted 
They're, people are afraid to speak. They're afraid of offending this company, offending their neighbors who want this and who are hoping for a lot of money. One person who's not afraid to speak out is Ray Campbell from Dimmock in Pennsylvania. Ray has become quite a celebrity in the anti-fracking campaign. Ray has been at the center of a very public row with Cabot Oil and Gas. Now Ray Campbell has had trouble with a gas well drilled across from his property for the last seven, eight years. This well has polluted his water completely. We're going to get there as soon as possible. Where, I need your address. Mm -hmm. Now instead of him selling out to the company, which they wanted him to do, he decided to fight. Now Ray is just a normal everyday guy. He's a biker, he's a truck driver. He's not someone who's an environmentalist. He never started out as an environment. He wouldn't even know what the word meant. But now he's fighting that company and he's pissed. He's really angry. And you will see his water. And this is not fake. The companies will tell you that Ray is faking his water. The water that comes out of his well is so poisonous that you can't even stand and breathe it. It'll make you gag. In fact, it'll probably make you throw up. It's full of fracking chemicals. Make a long story short, they started drilling in 2008. 2009, beginning at 10, everybody started seeing all the water going bad in their houses. And it started up on top of Carter Road and all the neighbors started talking. And that's when DEP came in and started doing the water testing. Ray used to work as a truck driver for the gas industry, but now runs a small car repair garage from his home. We lease our land too, uh, and they, there's a gas pad. They drilled wells. We don't have water issues or water worries. Uh, none of our neighbors do. You don't realize how valuable a resource well, water is until there's a problem with it, and then it's like your lifeline is affected. I feel bad for the people out here. The water's been tested, and it, it is for sure contaminated from the fracking process with fracking chemicals. It's public knowledge. In public statements, Cabot refutes the allegations that drinking water supplies in the area are contaminated with methane gas or chemicals from fracking. But Ray Kemble remains unconvinced. Industry is denial. They'll spend $100 million in denial instead of spending $50 million to correct it. Because if they admit they did it, come on. Imagine if they actually admitted that they polluted us. The lawsuit would be, you know, you wouldn't be able to put a hole in anywhere in the country or the world. Industry loves to turn around and go, it's naturally occurring. Yeah, it is naturally occurring. 8,000 feet underground. Until you drill the hole through that and through our water aquifers and you brought it to the surface, we didn't have it up here. Yeah, naturally occurring, 8,000 feet under us. It's April, and the winter snow has finally melted. But for Raymond Merzak, the onset of spring brought an unwelcome surprise. We went through the winter, this winter, when the, when the ice came off the lake, I had a, a pile of fish ten, at least 10 feet off the shore with just fish. This all goes back to last year. Last year, we had a, a water truck turnover on its side up here. The truck had to be within five feet of the lake. According to Raymond, the truck was carrying liquids from a nearby gas well fracking operation. When I saw finding the dead fish in the pond, I put them in my Kubota tractor's bucket and brought three loads of fish up here. And this is where I dumped them to get them away from the house so I didn't have to smell them. Whatever that was in that truck laid in that, laid in that lake all, all summer long and yeah, that's my summation, and then, and then it, when the ice came, it was sealed underneath the ice, and whatever it was, killed the fish. The DEP's water pollution biologist, Sherry Leap, has come to test the lake, two weeks after the dead fish were discovered. 0 0.5, fish like 4.0. I would think that there was no oxygen under the ice, because if there were fracking fluid in here, the conductivity there would not read 147 or 148. She said the water quality that she tested there was good, the conductivity was, everything seemed to be normal. And uh, 
And like I said to her, well, it's after the fact. You know, if you guys would had, first of all, if you had tested the water last year when the truck went in the water, I think we'd have, you'd have found a different story than what we're dealing with now. And I think whatever happened there is, is this is the end result of it. Like many others who fear the impact of the fracking process, Raymond is left to contemplate his predicament. But as if questions about its environmental impact were not enough, the oil and gas industry now faces a very different threat. We're in a valley right now because of the incredible low price of natural gas. OPEC led Saudi Arabia has declared war on shale energy in America. They are having trouble economically now. We've lost two, oh, maybe even three companies in my county at this point. They've stopped working. Virtually everything was rented in town for, for a period of time and office space was at a premium and local people did have jobs and they were very good paying jobs. I mean, they were like twice what uh, anything else paid around here. The reason why shale was the last place that the oil and gas industry went for fossil fuel development, the fundamental reason is that shale is basically impermeable. And the only way that you can conceivably, marginally economically, get oil or gas out of shale is to beat it to death. To beat shale to death using the fracking process requires a significant commitment of manpower and resources. All the risks associated with oil and gas in general, which are not inconsequential, get magnified because of the scale of this activity. Many more wells, longer wells, longer to drill each well, many more wells per pad, many more wells per square mile, much more intense use of chemicals, much higher waste, a lot more trucking, a lot more piping, a lot more emissions. Everything scales up. And as everything scales up, the risk factors go up. The intensity of the production process makes shale gas a relatively expensive fuel to produce, requiring the skills of specialist oil and gas workers who move from project to project as the gas wells come on stream. However, the falling oil price has put the brakes on new production, causing an estimated 100,000 job losses in the oil and gas industry in the US, as well as affecting local employment. We only have one rig operating in um, Bradford County right now. You will not see a lot of trucks on the road anymore. Um, they're just maintaining the wells, um, main, trying to maintain pipelines. That's all you're gonna see. These counties are depressed counties. They, the industry is pretty much gone. Uh, the only thing that's left is farming in many of them, and the farmers make a marginal living. So I understand that some of these big landowners, they're approached by the oil and gas companies and they're offered big money uh, for their property so that they can lease them for uh, fracking. I understand it, I get it. You know, that's, that's a lot of money and it puts them over, you know, it puts their grandchildren in college. In many parts of the US, landowners own their own mineral rights, so fracking was an attractive option for farmers like Glenn Felter. With failing eyesight, the offer of a share in the gas revenues was very attractive. <gasps> Definitely yeah. attractive. Got an income. I'm glad to see something's economically being done to help the whole area and helps my family farm and everything. Dairy farming is gone. I mean, I can count. Right, sitting right here, right around this area, I can count a hand full of farms that has gone because nobody can have the 40 cow dairy farm anymore. A lot of these old farmers would have basically had to take and sell their land into developments or whatever to live out their, their, their years, you know, their retirement years, let's say. But for farmers like the Felters, the slump in the oil price means they are now not receiving the income they had hoped for from the gas produced by wells on their land. They promise you one thing and then they figure out a way to, uh, so it's more money in their pocket and less in yours. I don't think that they should get to proceed too much further around here because there's some real issues uh, with the landowners that did allow fracking on their property. They aren't being fairly compensated around here. There are people that, uh, you know, in order to dress up their retirement, you know, a, a legitimate, uh, you know, a legitimate thought to help your retirement. They would have never allowed these rigs, um, their property to be 
disturbed in the manner it's been disturbed if they weren't going to get a royalty check out of it. The biggest problem is the monetary problems, the money. And we have one company that is taking, you know, if not all of people's royalties, um, a lot of them. And that's one of the things is people lease their land, I'm not sure, in your country who owns the minerals. But you have to make sure that you do. Chesapeake, the oil and gas company at the center of the dispute over royalty payments, has publicly denied any wrongdoing. But the company is currently the subject of an investigation by Pennsylvania State Attorney General and is also facing independent legal action from landowners in Pennsylvania and elsewhere in the United States. These corporations, they think they can last, they told us 100 years, then they told us 60 years for this energy, 20 years. And I can see how indebted they are, how they play their economic games. It's, it's going to end. So that's why I tell everybody there's going to come an end. So that's what I'm waiting for. While the economic woes of the shale gas industry are welcomed by anti-fracking campaigners, shale gas's supporters are vociferous in their backing for the continued extraction of the fuel. I'm not going to get into the global warming argument with you because I'm not a scientist. You know, I believe that there's climate change throughout history. I think we've seen it. You know, natural gas in our county has been the greatest thing to ever bring kids back home. They're back on a the farm, they graduate school, they go to technical school, they come back and go to work, they travel, as well as contributing to the federal government and the state government with already taxes that are in place. So any argument about not developing it is ridiculous. OPEC led Saudi Arabia's declared war on shale energy in America. I mean, they're driving down a price of crude oil, natural gas has gone down. If we think those people are just gonna sit back and say, you're right. Let's just compete with renewables. What we have is right under our feet. It's the answer to our local economies, our national economy, our state economy, and it is the new foreign policy. However, the geopolitical argument for shale gas does little to convince those who argue that the process is environmentally unsustainable. The climate doesn't respond to political opinion. The climate responds to chemistry. And the chemistry is that the climate responds to both carbon dioxide and methane. And we now know that the leakage, fugitive emissions, purposeful venting of methane from shale gas and oil development is very significant. So significant that it belies the notion that natural gas is a bridge fuel to a green, sustainable future. My feeling is that we were blessed with this creek and, and the state park and all of this beautiful creation and we enjoy it. Fishermen enjoy it probably the most and I hope that people think about future generations when they plan their what kind of energy they're going to use and really think about whether they, they want to put any of this at risk. Irrespective of the political, economic and environmental arguments for or against shale gas and fracking, the fact remains that many members of the community feel marginalized and victimized by the process none more so than Ray Kemble. Homeland Security, Secret Service. These guys showed up at your house? Uh-huh. They showed up with a SWAT team. Secret Service showed up with a SWAT team? Mm -hmm. Why? Because, again, I'm going to blow up the gas, I'm blowing up the gas wells, this and that, and everything else on the damn thing. And they even gave them the date and time I was going to go down and kill the president. Point is, you just don't realize the frustration people have Due to this, I mean, here it is in black and white. Uranium, 234. I said there, I was told two are weapons grade. Dear President Obama, I mean, I was really nice when I wrote this and everything else and everything else, and he still blew us off. And here I sit with no freaking goddamn water. Where do you go? Who do you see? You've destroyed my life, you destroyed my relationship, you destroyed my business, you destroyed my property. You can't sell it. Yeah. Oh, okay, you can't sell it without water. So a lot of things, I just said, right, I quit doing anything with the house because it's like, why should I put money into this? It's worth zero. So whatever you put into it, you're never going to see back. I have fought every freaking agency you can think of. I still got my guns, I still got my permits, and I'm still here. And I'm still talking. Just remember that. Although Ray believes he has proof that fracking has contaminated his water, in July 2012, the US Environment Protection Agency determined that the water tested in Dimmock was fit to drink. That's compliments of all the drilling and fracking, correct foundation, so the water runs in. 
Bray is not convinced. This is the well tank runs out, you know, for the well for the house. And we put the hose onto it because we run the water outside. And I was down here the other day, I forgot what I came down for, and I saw it was dripping. I was like, why? I might have got the flashlight and looked real good at it. It's like, hmm. It's, this is where it's starting to corrode. It's starting to eat through. Eating through the concrete and starting everything white where it's dripping at. So, you know, it's all the chemicals and stuff that's in the water. So explain, just explain what's going on, Ray. Well... Right now I'm hooking up this hose so we can run the water well into this bucket. It's a mystery every time we turn it on. Ray begins to purge the stagnant water from the well system. It's not really clear. Oh Christ, there's a smell already. Y'all be on the frack sites and everything else. I guess I'm just a lot more sensitive to it. It hits me and it just, I mean, it just kills me. After a few minutes, Ray's well water starts to discolor. All the water stinks. It's sometimes comes out black, brown. Today it's kind of grayish green. Um, some of the worst I've seen. Like I said before, Les, this is water that EPA says is safe to drink and bathe in. And when I turn around and went to pour them the glasses of water, they refused to drink it. Would you drink it? Would you drink it? So, you know, they're, they're full of shit. Well, I said, when we run that well, these are different times we've taken water out of the well. Okay? And we don't have any of the black water. Craig's got it. You just never know what you're going to get when you turn that well on. 